how am I time wise? You're just over. Okay, so I won't go into a lot of things I was going to say, but I do want to say this that the ban treaties unambiguous prohibition of threat of use is an essential point for the peace movement and civil society in the nuclear armed and nuclear dependent states to highlight in our public education and advocacy. The ideology of nuclear deterrence must be delegitimized and stigmatized to make progress on abolishing nuclear weapons and our task is to change the discourse from the bottom up. And this, I think, is the most important thing we can do. As we've seen with ICANN leading the effort to change the discourse from nuclear, you know, national security to humanitarian consequences. But changing the discourse will require the courage not only to speak truth to power, but also to speak truth to each other. To build the necessary political will in the nuclear armed and nuclear dependent states, we will need to move public opinion from the irrational fear-based ideology of deterrence to the rational fear of an eventual nuclear weapons use, whether by accident or design, by some nuclear armed state that places its own survival above the survival of its own people. We will also need to stimulate a rational hope that security can be redefined in humanitarian and ecologically sustainable terms that will lead to the elimination of nuclear weapons and dramatic demilitarization, freeing up tremendous resources desperately needed to address universal needs, universal human needs, and protect the environment. And I'll stop there, and hopefully there'll be some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. You can see that over 35 years, she's developed a whole lot more to say. Uh, our next speaker is Leslie Kucharski. As I mentioned before, she is uh, now in her final semester of the MA program in nonproliferation and terrorism studies here at the, Monterey, at the Middlebury Institute at Monterey. And she will talk about her experiences while interning at the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs earlier this year while this treaty was being developed and related topics. So, Leslie. All right, thank you. Is this on? You can hear yes, me? The okay. Green light is on. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion. The ban treaty and uh, the movement that led to it is something that I've been studying here at MIS. And thanks to the Institute and its connections, I had the privilege of. Um, as has been said, working at the United Nations while the treaty was being negotiated. Um, oh, you can't hear? Okay, sorry. Um, so since I worked for the UN, is that good now? Can I, can I, can I get a thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, since I worked for the UN, I should start with a short disclaimer. My views do not necessarily represent those of the UN. I'm just sharing my own personal thoughts you know, based on my studies and experience. Um, that being said, I think it's safe to say that the treaty is fully compatible with the principles of the United Nations. Um, from the very foundation of the UN, disarmament, including nuclear disarmament, has been one of the primary objectives of the institution. And as Jacqueline mentioned, um, you know, this was seen in the first resolution adopted by the General Assembly at its first session 72 years ago about establishing you know, a commission to deal with the problems related to uh, atomic energy. And it's, uh, the commission was tasked with, among other things, making specific proposals for the elimination of nuclear weapons from national armaments. Uh, so despite that, the history of nuclear proliferation, non-proliferation, and disarmament reveals that member states comprising the UN you know, while agreeing on the objective of nuclear disarmament, disagree on how and under which circumstances to go about achieving it. So I'd like to use my allotted time to speak about the ban treaty in the context of the larger debate regarding the approach to disarmament. Um, in order to better understand the movement behind the ban treaty, I think it's useful to understand the arguments of the not insignificant number of states that are resisting it. So, um, as my colleague mentioned, 122 states, you know, adopted, well, voted for the treaty, and that there are like, I think, 193 member states of the UN. So, you know, 193 minus 122, that's a pretty significant number. 
Um, so one thing I've noticed, particularly during my time at the UN, is that there's a growing tendency for um, states and people on both sides of the divide to talk at each other rather than with each other in a constructive manner towards you know, a mutually beneficial compromise. Um, this was illustrated by one uh, roundtable discussion I attended at the UN. Um, this was before the second session of the conference for the Ban Treaty. It was, uh, it had members of civil society and representatives of government, some of which possess nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I was surprised and kind of depressed at, at the high level of boredom I experienced at the event. I mean, like, how can you really be bored when listening to leading civil society advocates, including the head of ICANN, which, as we've mentioned, just won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, and representatives from nuclear weapon states? You know, they're debating nuclear weapons face-to-face -face in an unofficial setting. Like, that should be very exciting, right? But um, the event, it turns out, like, uh, reflecting, it wasn't really depressing. Uh, I mean, it was depressing, not surprising. And this is because they were really talking at each other, like over each other's heads. They weren't really engaging each other. Um, so if all states share the objective of nuclear disarmament, why do some reject the ban treaty? And why won't the opposing sides have a fruitful dialogue? Um, to shed light on this you know, paradox, I think it's useful to look back at the history and understand the historical and political context of the treaty. Um, so, as has been said already, the divide has its origins in another treaty related to nuclear weapons, that's the NPT. Um, you know, it opened for signature in 1968, and it's the legal foundation of all efforts related to nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament, as well as peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Um, and according to the treaty, Five states are legally permitted to possess nuclear weapons while all their states are not allowed to have them. So these two provisions make the treaty inherently unequal. And you know, states participating in the negotiations understood that, so some led a successful effort to create the other provision which forces the five <laughs> nuclear weapon states to eliminate their arsenals. Um, and as a result, the treaty permits Five states legally possess them on the condition that they eventually eliminate them. And this, this condition was kind of ambiguously worded and um, it's really become the root of the divide of these two camps. And so you fast forward 49 years to 2017 and uh, you know, briefly assessing the implementation of the NPT, you can see that, you know, the many states who gave up their right to pursue nuclear weapons, you know, they're arguing that the five states who have them are not keeping up their end of the bargain. You know, they all still possess nuclear weapons, and on top of that, you know, four other states who are not party to that treaty anyway have, they've acquired nuclear weapons. So that's just, like, something's not working. That's, you know, the idea behind the movement. Um, so it's, kind of you know, an expression of dissatisfaction with the lack of progress in the old framework, the old treaty. Um, in the ban treaty, as Jacqueline mentioned, it, it, like, it eliminates the hierarchy created by the NPT by making the possession by any state illegal. So you know, our notions of you know, fairness and equality like, really applaud this development. But uh, does it mean that the states who oppose the ban treaty want to possess nuclear weapons indefinitely? Like, with that question in mind, like, can, we can move to that side of the debate. Um, so states possessing nuclear weapons and their allies emphasize that nuclear weapon states have and continue to decrease the size of their arsenals. For example, you know, the size of the US and Russian arsenals um, has decreased by thousands since the peak of the Cold War, <laughs> and that's really significant and tangible progress uh, towards nuclear disarmament. Um, you know, and this happened and continues to happen within the framework of the old NPT treaty. Um, and opponents of the ban treaty don't see the point in creating a separate platform for nuclear disarmament through the ban treaty, because one already exists. Um, 
And they also emphasize, especially now, in light of <coughs> recent advancements in North Korea's nuclear weapons program, that it, it would not be in their security interests or the security interests of their allies to accelerate the rate of nuclear disarmament. Um, so this is a complicated argument. One aspect of it is that it doesn't make sense for them to disarm when other states, like North Korea, are not committed to the same obligation. You know, would the U.S. like to give up its nuclear weapons and have North Korea be the one calling the shots? Um, so knowing a little bit about the, the context of the divide, we can turn to the other question, like why did the two sides just talk at each other? And to me, this is the key, it, like the answer lies in the different conceptions of security. So the states, you know, advocating the ban treaty think of security mostly in terms of like human security, like collective, like we are all together. Um, you know, they emphasize the disastrous gendered humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons, whether intentionally or by accident. Um, you know, these, ef these effects are indifferent to borders and generations. So space and time, they transcend all of that. And because of that, the advocates argue that nuclear weapons are morally wrong and should be illegal. Um, but, you know, this is not to say that those who are against the ban treaty deny the humanitarian consequences. I, I don't think that's fair. Um, but instead, they choose to emphasize security in um, different terms, not on the level of, you know, collective all, but on the level of states. Um, and according to international law, states have the right to protect themselves. And some states exercise that right with nuclear weapons legally at least five in accordance with the NPT. Um, that's debatable though. <laughs> I, I, I can sense that right here. <laughs> um, that's at least the argument. So, um, and they, you know, until they feel that nuclear weapons no longer benefit their security interests, then they will retain them. So disarmament for them is a long-term and gradual process. So you can't just do it overnight. You can't just ban nuclear weapons and then all of a sudden there are none. Um, so the discussion of state security is one that the ban advocates are really tired of hearing. You know, so they want to reframe the conventional understanding of security uh, and nuclear disarmament. Um, so I guess to conclude, like if progress towards nuclear disarmament is to continue, so I think generally we should recognize that it has, the process has already begun. You can debate how, you know, should it be happening quicker or not. Um, so if this process is to continue, then each side really needs to work to understand the both conceptions of security um, and, you know, try to make a bridge between them. So the policy of talking at one another is not, is not sustainable or conducive to forward progress, you know, just kind of alienates the other side to the point where they don't want to engage with each other. And how are you going to move forward if you're not talking to each other? Um, so I think it just really exacerbates the division. And I think that's a good handoff to Masako, who will talk about education. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. And maybe there'll be some questions for Leslie later on. So our third uh, panelist will be Masako Toki, who is the Education Project Manager at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. And she will discuss the role of civil society, especially the Hibakusha, atomic bomb survivors, and Japan's policy toward the Ban Treaty. She will also talk about the importance of youth education on nuclear disarmament, using an example of the CNS Education Project for High School Students, the Critical Issue Forums. Masako. Okay. Thank you very much for attending today's uh, event. And also, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my views on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, or nuclear weapons ban treaty. I just wanted to uh, add a little bit of a disclaimer that this is purely my personal views and uh, do not necessarily reflect those of the organization to which I belong. So in my talk, I would like to focus on the important role of civil society and uh, especially on the role of Hibakusha, 
the survivors of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki in Japan. I also want to touch upon the Japanese government's policy and attitude toward the nuclear ban treaty, which is significant since Japan remained the only country that has experienced the wartime nuclear devastation while being protected by the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Finally, I want to talk about the role of youth education, particularly the project that I am currently coordinating, the Critical Issues Forum, which is centered on disarmament and non-proliferation education for high school students. Also, uh, as for the Critical Issues Forum, I placed a uh, uh, couple of dozens of the uh, this uh, flyer at the registration area. So if you are interested in, please feel free to take one copy. So I would like to add my voice to congratulate the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN, for receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. I have uh, actually a few friends at ICANN, so I'm particularly very happy for them. The Norwegian Nobel Committee pointed out ICANN has worked so hard to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and made groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons. So of course, as you know, ICANN is a non-governmental organization and a member of our civil society. So United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres commended the role of civil society in his statement at the signing ceremony for the Ban Treaty on September 20th. He stated, civil society played a vital role in bringing the treaty to fruition. The heroic survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Hibakusha, continued to remind us of the devastating humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. ICANN Executive Director Beatrice Finn also connected the role of the Hibakusha to the ICANN's disarmament efforts as follows. The Nobel Peace Prize is not only for the ICANN, but also for the survivors of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is their prize as well. Hibakusha have been a part of this campaign from the beginning, and they are the ones who brought the humanitarian consequences message already in 1945. Hiroshima bombing survivor Setsuko Thurlow has been a great spokesperson who contributed to the cause of ICANN. Setsuko shared her stories so many times. Sometimes for Hibakusha, it's quite traumatic to talk about the, their own experiences, but uh, he was so brave and uh, shared her experience many times all around the world. The Ban Treaty is a great example of the most successful collective efforts by the like-minded governments, civil society, atomic bombing survivors, academia, and scholars. Since the advent of the nuclear weapons and the nuclear age, Nuclear weapons policies have been challenged by anti-nuclear weapons movement in civil society. Looking back at non-governmental organization, NGO, participation in nuclear disarmament history, the role of civil society cannot be undermined, underestimated, sorry, underestimated. Civil society continues to grow more and more critical and its voice has become more influential to nuclear weapons policy. Recently, as seen in ICANN, younger generations are working effectively in creative and innovative ways to mobilize civil society. There have been several remarkable achievements by civil society in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation as demonstrated in the history of the Nobel Peace Prize, which has been awarded several civil society groups or individuals for their anti-nuclear uh, weapon work. These civil society groups include the Pugwash Conference on Science and World Affairs and the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear, Web uh, Nuclear War, or IPPNW. And IPPNW later launched ICAM movement. 
The adoption of the Ban Treaty on July 7th was a historic and highly emotional moment for all the countries who supported the treaty. Civil society members were jubilant, especially a group of Hibakusha who endured unspeakable ordeals of atomic bombing and its after effects. Their only wish is to see world moving toward free of nuclear weapons. Conference President Elaine White Gomez of Costa Rica, among other delegates, commented on the vital role civil society organizations, especially a Hibakusha group, have played in the adoption of the treaty. The ICANN Executive Director Beatrice Finn asserted that the adoption of this treaty feels like a momentous step forward, even if the nuclear weapons states and most nuclear weapons dependent states have not participated. The moral norm has been declared very clearly with the united will of the world's people behind it. Nuclear weapons in any hands are wrong. So the adoption of this treaty by itself will not make nuclear weapons disappear. Still, I think it is fair to say that banning nuclear weapons is a response to a long-standing aspiration of humanity. Every year, on the day of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and 9th, each city issues a peace declaration. This year, both cities peace declaration clearly supported the Ban Treaty. The Hiroshima Peace Declaration was read by Hiroshima Mayor and illustrated the horror of a single nuclear weapon that killed over 140,000 people. The mayor depicted an absolute evil that was uh, unleashed in the sky over Hiroshima and implored the audience who gathered to the annual memorial ceremony to imagine for a moment what happened under the roiling mushroom cloud. It is important to imagine and try to understand what happened under the mushroom cloud because that is the where you can find the actual effects of the use of nuclear weapons. The shape of a mushroom cloud from the distance that many of us are familiar with is not the actual effect of the use of nuclear weapons. Therefore, it is crucial to listen to atomic bombing survivors' testimonials. Such direct, immediate first-person accounts fill the gap in historical facts of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and help to give a clear understanding of the actual effects of the use of nuclear weapons against human beings. The Hibakusha recollections help to demystify nuclear weapons and remove any euphoria or sanitization about the use of atomic bombs. It is inevitable that one day there will be a world without any Hibakusha to tell us the, Im the impact of nuclear weapons, and that time is fast approaching. Currently, the average Hibakusha is over 81 years of age. Consequently, now is the time to teach the next generation about the very real effects of the use of nuclear weapons and how to prevent these weapons from ever being used again. Unfortunately, given the advanced age of most Hibakusha, it is unlikely that a world without nuclear weapons will become reality within their lifetime. However, the successful adoption of the Ban Treaty and the ICANN's Nobel Peace Prize Award must be so encouraging to these Hibakusha. While the states possessing nuclear weapons made it very clear that they will never join the treaty, and the states under the protection of their nuclear umbrella are likely to follow suit, this is an historic event in the nuclear disarmament movement. The Ban Treaty will help to stigmatize nuclear weapons and by doing so, help to strengthen the norms against their very existence. Once in effect, 
This treaty would prohibit states from developing, testing, producing, manufacturing, transferring, possessing, stockpiling, using or threatening to use nuclear weapons. Sesko Thalo, one of the most vocal Hibaksha, said, nuclear weapons have always been immoral. Now they are also illegal. In her closing statement, right after the ban treaty was adopted, as many people say, this is the beginning of the end of nuclear weapons, and there is still an enormous task ahead of us. Opponents of the nuclear ban treaty, a group which includes all the nuclear weapon states and allies under their extended nuclear deterrence, have not only boycotted the negotiations but also criticized the treaty for deepening the division between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. The Japanese government, my own country, um, also argued that efforts to enact a nuclear ban treaty without engaging the nuclear weapons states will only deepen the schism and delay the goal of a world free of nuclear weapons. Japan's decision not to participate in the negotiations has generated a tremendous disappointment, both outside and inside Japan, especially, of course, among the Hibakusha. Many believe that since Japan is the only country to have uh, suffered the effects of the use of a nuclear bomb in wartime, it has a moral responsibility to lead efforts to create a world without nuclear weapons. The Japanese government surely must have experienced a tremendous dilemma to come to this decision, considering the extremely strong anti-nuclear weapons sentiment among its people. One of the Hibakusha who participated in the negotiation said, as a Hibakusha and as a Japanese, I am here today heartbroken, yet I am not discouraged. Japan continues to hope to be a bridge builder for nuclear disarmament, uniting the international community in making progress toward a world free of nuclear weapons. However, by boycotting the ban treaty negotiation entirely, Japan may have undermined its credentials as a disarmament champion and even as a bridge builder. In an effort to continue to champion nuclear disarmament, the Japanese government recently launched a new initiative called the Eminent Persons Group, which sought to encourage dialogue between nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. The group includes people with a wide range of opinions who both support and oppose the ban treaty. However, the current international security environment surrounding nuclear weapons, as we all witness on a daily basis, contribute to an uh, inescapable sense of uh, stagnation in nuclear disarmament on a deeper level. In this sense, it is crucial to provide younger generations with disarmament and non-proliferation education and tools to strive for that goal. The memories of the Hibakusha play a vital role in reminding the youth of the urgency of the cause and the devastating consequences if we fail to reign in the nuclear horror. In that area, one of the Japanese government's initiatives, Youth Communicator for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons, which was launched in 2010, is highly praiseworthy. As a strong believer in the power of education for making progress toward nuclear weapons free world, I have been organizing the Critical Issues Forum, a disarmament education for high school students. So this year, we held a conference in Nagasaki, Japan, to strengthen our determination to assure that Nagasaki would be the last city.